This innocent man, Jesus, has just been put through several illegal trials, beaten, mocked, given a crown of thorns, had to carry his cross through jeering crowds of people who cried for his death in place of a murderer. After all that, his wrists and his ankles were nailed to a cross and he was lifted up in great agony by cruel soldiers. In all this suffering, Jesus did not lose his faith in his Father God. In his agony, would he cry for pity? Would he condemn and curse his persecutors? No. We know the story. In his love for those he came to die for, he forgot himself and prayed for those who were hurting him. Here we see Jesus' love for his enemies, the Romans and all the others crucifying him. And we hear the first words from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Yet they knew exactly what they were doing, didn't they? They were killing this rebel. They were killing this upstart who was causing so much trouble. Perhaps on the surface, they knew exactly what they were doing. But of course, as we look beneath the surface, they had no idea what they were doing. We know Jesus had taught about the need to love our enemies. In Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 5, we read, I tell you, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And now we see Jesus putting his own words into practice in the most extreme of circumstances. It does seem also wrong, such a travesty. But Luke wants us to know that this grim scene, filled with cruel irony, is at the heart of our redemption and that Christ's crucifixion was God's plan. Jesus is not on the cross because God's plan had stopped working. He's not on the cross because something went wrong that God did not foresee. Jesus is on the cross being crucified because it is God's plan. It's his purpose. It's his way of salvation. As challenging and awkward as that may be to try and understand. Luke explains that when, uh, that what Jesus is doing here is precisely what scriptures prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years ago that the Messiah would do. When Jesus goes to Calvary, he goes there in the company of criminals, robbers and thieves, in fulfillment of Scripture. He's surrounded by those who mock him in fulfillment of Scripture. He forgives transgressors in fulfillment of Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 53, written 600 years before these events, we read, he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And in Psalm 
22 that begins with the great words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Later on in that psalm, we read, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. That's not only important for early Christians to understand, it's important for us to understand. And perhaps especially when we ourselves encounter dark and challenging times in our own lives and faith journeys. Luke wants us to know God's plan when we look at the cross. God was not asleep. God was not caught off guard. It was going exactly as he planned, and he had written it down hundreds of years before. But Luke wants us to understand that in Jesus' fulfillment of Scripture, God's plan is being accomplished at the cross, but he also wants us to understand who Jesus is, because we have to understand who Jesus is to understand the importance of the cross. We can't really understand the cross until we understand who's on it. We don't think of the two people either side of Jesus other than in relation to Jesus. We wouldn't have this story if it wasn't that it was Jesus on that cross. Jesus, God's one and only Son, God sacrificing himself on the cross for you and for me. And it is on that cross that Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, prays that amazing prayer. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus' life, almost at an end. The pain is excruciating. Yet he's not praying for his mother. He's not praying for his dear disciples. He's not praying for the church that's going to come into being as a result of his death. The moment of his agony, he's praying for his enemies not praying for revenge, that God's judgment and punishment would fall on them, but praying for forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. That is what the cross is all about. These words of Jesus don't only point to the way of our salvation. They don't only reveal to us the character of the God we serve. They also give us two examples to follow. The example of prayer and the example of forgiveness. These are not optional extras for super super keen Christians. They're the duty and responsibility of every Christian. Just as Jesus prayed for his enemies, so we are called to pray for people who are still God's enemies, cut off from God by their sins, to pray that they'll find forgiveness and new life in Christ. God calls us to pray 
for those who are persecuting our fellow believers in this country and around the world. To pray for the Christians that they will have God's grace to stand firm in the faith. I finish by reading from poster 10 in those posters outside the crucifixion. In Aleppo, Syria, a crucifix riddled with bullet holes hangs on the wall. A graphic picture with the hands still on the wall, but no arms. They've been shot off. The church, the body of Christ, also faces violence and destruction, but we know that the road to resurrection lies through the cross. Pray for the courage to walk that road for ourselves, for people, for people we know, and for persecuted Christians around the world.